Hello Matrix and welcome to the last one uh, of this November 2018 uh, 2020 paper one physical science from IEV so let's just wrap it up so that we can move on to paper two okay so we're doing question eight <coughs> and we're gonna do eight and nine okay the last two now we are told there 8.1 um, an electromagnet okay so once you hear that word you already know that this is some sort of a metal core with a loop of wire that has a current passing through it wrapped around it isn't it so that's your grade 11 essentially so that means even if you are in grade 11 you can just follow on on this one Okay, it's shown in the diagram below and the north and south poles are indicated. Okay, so that's great. So they've already told us this is north, this is south. Now the question is, does the current flow around the coil from P to Q or from Q to P? Now, the law that we use here is what we call the right hand solenoid rule because remember this is what would be a solenoid, okay? So, we're going to use the right-hand solenoid rule, okay? I don't know if you can see it well. So, basically, it means the thumb is pointing in the direction of the North Pole, and then the curled fingers are pointing at the direction of the current in the coil, okay? So, as you can see, the fingers are curling in that direction, while my thumb is pointing in the North direction. And, of course, inside the coil, or within the electromagnet, we know that the magnetic field is directed from south to north, okay? So basically, if that is the case, we know that our coil, our direction of the current is going to be in that direction. Okay, so it is clear that it's going from Q to P. All right, <coughs> so that is essentially the story so we're going to go from Q to P keyword here is you use the right hand solenoid rule okay that is what you need to use here to get around a solenoid remember an electromagnet is essentially a solenoid with a metal core Okay, not a problem, let's go. What will be the effect on the electromagnet of increasing the current in the coil? And of course, we know that, well, if we increase the current in the coil, uh, that's essentially saying we're going to increase the induced EMF, right? <laughs> and if that's what we're doing, and we're essentially increasing the magnetic field, so that means we're going to essentially increase the strength of that magnet. Um, basically, this is all built from Faraday's law. Okay. So know these laws back and forth, guys, because they will give you a lot more freedom. Because you know, from your Ohm's law, current is directly proportional to voltage, right? In this case, this is going to be the EMF. So if you increase the current, you're increasing the EMF. The EMF is directly proportional to the change in the magnetic flux, which is itself, what? The magnetic field B multiplied by the area th that is enclosed in the coil, and of course it's vector to the normal, so cos theta. So do you realize there that if you are increasing the current, you are effectively increasing the EMF, which is directly proportional to the change in our magnetic flux. That means that would increase, right? And if it increases, we're increasing the magnetic field. Because, I mean, the enclosed area in the coil is essentially the same. So what, in essence, are we doing? The electromagnet becomes stronger. So we're just going to see that the electromagnetic strength is, is going to increase. We can say the strength of the electromagnet increases. I'm just going to use an R of weight. 
Okay, so that is essentially just how you get your two marks. Again, it's just a deeper understanding of these relationships. So make sure your scientific principles are on point, guys, okay? Whether they have flaws or not, they are the only way we can, at this point in time, explain what goes on around us. So easy to mark stay. Okay. Now 8.2 says a loop of wire is placed between permanent magnets as shown in a side view and a top view. The direction of the current in the loop is indicated. So already we have a current in the loop. So you know what happens if you have a loop placed in a magnetic field and there is a current through the loop. That is essentially a motor, right? You think of the Fleming's left hand motor rule here because we are already doing mechanics from electrical energy because we know that if this loop of wire carries a current and it is placed in a magnetic field its interaction of its own magnetic field and that of the magnets will create a force okay that will cause the coil to rotate or to move okay not a problem. So let's have a look at this one. So we can see that this is the side view. And of course the coil is either rotating clockwise or anti-clockwise. We'll find out. <coughs> and then on the top view, we are being told that the current is going in. And as you can see that X there is sort of like an arrow. When it's going away, you see those sort of like leaflet areas that make a cross going away from you and then when it's pointing towards you it's like the sharp end which is almost like a dot coming out of the page so we said here there is a current in the wire or in the coil which is placed in a magnetic field so that means we're going to use left hand <coughs> sorry motor room now to decide where the force is going to be experienced because I mean that is essentially what we want to know Okay, so let's look at this side view. Of course, in this section of the wire that's coming out, we know that, of course, the magnetic field between these two magnets is going to be from north to south. So that's your index finger. Let's just get a little bit out. That's your index finger there. And then we know that the current is the middle finger, which is coming out. So we're looking at this section, right? And then if that's the case, what will be the force on this wire? It's going to be directed upward. And if it is directed upward, this coil is going to rotate in this direction. Because the force tells us exactly how this coil is going to spin. Then let's look at this segment here. The current is going into the coil. But the magnetic field from these two magnets is going to be from north to south. But the current is going in. This time that means our finger switches around. So you see the current is going in. The magnetic field is going. So the force is going to be directed down. And if it is directed down, then this coil is going to spin in that direction. So in essence, our coil is going to spin in a clockwise direction. And then the same thing here will happen. The coil is going to spin in this direction. As we have just explained so always get into the idea of which rule you need based on the information that you're given so that you do not confuse because there's a lot of rules here that work similarly but they are applied in different circumstances now the question says the loop of wire experiences a force okay that is what we already established now it says using the side view diagram Will the loop rotate clockwise or anti-clockwise? Of course, it's going to be clockwise. We just established. Okay. Of course, you're going to be using the Fleming's left-hand motor rule. Why? Because there is a current carrying conductor that is placed in a magnetic field. That, once you hear that, you know you're going to use Fleming's left-hand rule. But if you have a conductor that is placed in a magnetic field and there's some force that rotates or moves the wire in that magnetic field, that means the purpose is to induce a current by changing the magnetic flux. And that essentially means we are looking at a generator. And if it is a generator, then we're using Fleming's right-hand 
dynamo room well that is all about generation of electricity okay <clears throat> let's just move now it says again using the side view will the equilibrium position of the coil be vertical or horizontal now what do you know about equilibrium that means the resultant force must be zero isn't it so at what instance is this getting the maximum amount of force obviously when it's horizontal you can tell that the force is directly you know perpendicular to it so it's almost going to be like uh, hmm okay let's not use the word perpendicular but we know the, the force is going to be maximal when this coil is horizontal ne? but when it's vertical the only thing that causes it to spin past that vertical position because at the vertical position remember the magnetic field is going at uh, in that direction and then uh, the coil is you know changing direction I mean the current is trying to change direction in the coil so in essence in that setup when it's in the vertical position the coil essentially experiences zero magnetic force okay that is when it is in balance okay when it's vertical it experiences zero magnetic force okay and why because this is when the coil is itself at right angles with the um, direction of the magnetic field by the two magnets and we know that there's no work done by perpendicular force right yeah well, it has to be you know either acting in along or some components but if it is perpendicular we know that from work that cos of zero becomes oops yeah well. so that is stuff that needs to be considered anyway guys um, the essence of this is the fact that hey, sometimes let's not overly explain these things the idea is that what carries this wire through because it experiences maximum force when it is horizontal but once it's vertical what essentially moves it across is its momentum remember momentum is mass times velocity remember this wire has a bit of mass and if it has a velocity from that force the resultant force it will essentially carry it past that um, what you call that state of equilibrium so equilibrium means resultant force and it experiences resultant force when it is vertical so the answer is vertical here but at horizontal it experiences the maximum resultant force okay guys that's very easy so at least you need to know some of the words what they imply physical science wise and then you can easily figure it out but some of these things can be confusing I mean it's not so easy sometimes to be comfortable with what you have at times it's a matter of being lucky to get it right okay but you realize that even when someone answers it correctly then you realize that ish I was actually right because I chose the right answer but under the wrong <laughs> influences but thank God they were not detrimental so these are dynamic stuffs so dynamics are always things that interchange so you need to pay attention to what exactly is being implied in a given scenario okay not a problem so let's just keep moving guys it's very easy this one is always the easiest I mean if you don't get marks anywhere in physics you know you must get full marks here there's no need to lose marks it's usually very simple now 8.3 says the diagram shows a device that can be used either as a DC motor or a DC generator okay fine do you agree yes you should because there are no uh, slip rings here there's a split ring or the so-called commutator which is that P there so of course if we connect a direct current source here then this becomes a direct current motor or is it DC electric motor but if we connect a bulb here and then we sort of cause I mean external force here 
we move this thing in this field then it will induce a current which is going to be ensured to flow in one direction by this commutator and then we'll see our light bulb shining and that means we are now generating electricity so we know that a motor converts electrical to mechanical energy we know that a generator connects mechanical energy into electrical energy now what is indicated by what is indicated in the diagram by the letter P of course is the commutator commutator or you can say it's the split ring I mean this one cannot be overly emphasized guys I mean I'm sure you're getting bored when you see these kinds of questions because they are everywhere explain how this device would work as a DC electric motor okay you must refer to the input so what should be the input is a DC current okay and then of course required and then how it functions so basically all you need you need a DC current source all right and then this will induce a magnetic field around the conductor right and we know that a current current conductor has a magnetic field around it and then we find the direction of the field by using flame I mean the right hand curl finger rule and what happens when the magnetic field of this conductor due to its current it's carrying together with the magnetic field that is going to be placed in due to the magnets okay those magnetic fields will interact and depending on the strength of each interaction it will cause the coil to move okay and essentially it will move endlessly of course due to the momentum that it will have and of course the influences of those forces and as a result we get a mechanical output which is the constant rotation of that coil of course if we keep increasing or manipulating the strength or the current strength then that may even be faster okay so I think that is essentially how it works so let's just try to write this one down because I think it's a little bit nicer to to try and answer this much more concisely so 8.3.2 uh, so basically we're going to have a direct current source connected to the coil okay all right then the coil will have a magnetic field we okay we'll have a magnetic field due to the current okay and then we'll have here an interaction of the magnetic fields okay that is of the magnets and the current carrying conduct okay yeah so we're going to have a, a direct um, current source of course that is the input okay and then this will cause the current to experience a magnetic field due to the current it's carrying and then there will be an interaction of the magnetic field due to the magnet and the magnetic field due to the current carrying conductor and then this will result into the conductor experiencing a resultant force causing 
it to spin I can I don't know you can say spin or to move let's just say to move okay we're just using this in general but it will essentially spin all right and that's essentially the mechanical effect of a motor because we want it to do mechanical work okay be it to drill things or to chop things or whatever we want to do we want mechanical output so this is essentially the mechanical output that we are aiming for so this is ju just how you would go about it maybe just these three points four points you can just get some marks there and then of course 8.3.3 what they are asking is now explain how this device would work as a DC generator you must refer to the input required and how it functions again we said here fine the input here is going to be some sort of force we can say mechanical I'm fan mechanical input okay but of course it has to be a force but this force is external right and then this will for will cause the coil to move in the magnetic field resulting into a change in the magnetic flux okay which itself is going to induce a current in the coil I can say conduct and then of course this is the electrical output we are looking for okay not a problem so please be very good at doing this I mean I've done it in sort of like a crazy way but you understand you just have to understand how these things work all right so basically here you're just going to induce some movement of the coil by applying an external force and this will cause the coil to move in the magnetic field in essence changing the magnetic flux and we know from Faraday's law if you're changing the magnetic flux then we're going to be essentially inducing an EMF but that EMF of course is going to cause a current in the coil and that is what we want which is the electrical output so it's as simple as that again you walk away with your marks there then it says suggest one change that would improve its operation as a motor and as a generator but just one change okay not too many now if we want this to be efficient as a motor that means we want it to be fast okay because efficiency is all about time it's time dependent because if something takes forever to do a job it's not really efficient is it because it is actually going to start costing us in a way so what we would rather have is something that is efficient meaning relatively fast and for this to be to be fast we can just increase the magnetic field strength of these magnets that's one way we can make this faster or we can increase the current in the coil so essentially here there's two things that you can change as a motor one is the strength of the magnets okay two is going to be increasing the strength of the current okay let's just say increase the strength of the magnets or increase the current strength in the coil okay great so those are the two things that we can do as a motor because if we do that then this is going to be much faster 
and that means it's going to be much more efficient then as a generator we can do two things as well remember here we want an output of a very high current let's say we want a high current because a slow current remember the power of our devices is going to be much less and that means they won't be as efficient if you want a bright light you're going to get a dim light sort of so now to improve this what must we do fine we know from electromagnetic inductions law by Faraday is that if we increase the number of turns in the coil okay it will induce an even bigger current so increase the number of turns in the coil that will come out with a bigger EMF and that means a bigger current what else we can do uh, uh, the other thing that we can do here is also to increase the magnetic field strength okay so we can also increase the strength of the magnets all right three uh, we can also increase the speed of the coils or rotation so there's a few things we can say here if we increase the speed of the core rotation remember that means the flux is going to be much faster in changing and therefore inducing a bigger current so you can just pick any of the two maybe out of these three you pick two and then here you can pick two as well and that's how you walk away with your 18 marks of that question so I hope it was easy to follow I mean this is pretty much what is standard here so they didn't trick at all so I guess they kind of relieved you guys of the pressure in these last two questions maybe four questions because even the electricity questions were not so difficult now let's do question nine quickly now it says uh, define okay the work function for zinc is 6,90 times 10 to the minus 19 joules okay so not a problem now it says define work function of course we know what that is work function is essentially uh, the minimum energy required uh, to emit or to eject let's just say eject electrons from a metal surface all right that is easy I mean textbook style I mean textbook stuff so should not be too difficult I mean please 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 it cannot be overly emphasized that you need to know all the definitions if you forget them at least know the equations that can remind you what that is okay okay not a problem for you if you forget this just know that the work function is W sub 0 is going to be equal to Planck's constant multiplied by the threshold frequency and you know that this combination essentially is energy because energy is Planck's constant multiplied by frequency so as you know is fine if this is the story work function is some Planck's constant multiplied by a frequency this is threshold frequency but what is the combination of Planck's constant and frequency is essentially energy so then you know that okay this is going to be some energy but because this is minimum stuff and then yeah it can give you a bit of an idea and then you try and use your English language to formulate the words to then put this to rest calculate the smallest frequency of light that will increase electrons again you see they're saying the smallest that is threshold frequency sometimes they like to use simple English to get you in trouble that is just threshold frequency so threshold frequency related to work function from that formula so it's as simple as that so let's just answer it here 
Okay, we have question 9. I've been a little bit haphazard here, I know. 9.1.2. Okay, so we want the smallest frequency. So we know for a fact that the work function is equal to Planck's constant multiplied by the threshold frequency. Therefore, our threshold frequency is going to be that one. Okay, some people call it omega zero. Okay, you can say W sub zero over Planck's constant. Okay, they told us that the energy, the work function, sorry, was 6,90 times 10 to exponent minus 19. Please don't say times 10 to the power. It's wrong. This whole thing is a power. Okay? Don't say 10 to the power. There's no power at the exponent. <laughs> this is all a power. Just take note of that. So don't use these common uh, errors of physics or should I say science because there's a lot of common problems. Because now, yeah, so this is 6 times, I mean 6, 9 times 10 to exponent minus 19 or 6, what? 6, 9 times the power of base 10 raised to the exponent. Okay, minus 9. So this is the exponent or index. When I was doing grade 9, we were using heavily that word index, minus 19 or whatever you want to say. And then that is the base. Okay, so you are raising the base or you are powering the base by raising it to this exponent. Okay, so please, I don't know why I felt like I should explain that because I mean, we're not doing maths here. So who cares? Actually, I care. All right, so what is Planck's constant is 6,6 6 times 10 to the minus 34. Sometimes get used to this by heart. So that if you are in trouble at some point and this is not written or not provided, but I, I doubt if they would ever allow that to happen. So, yeah, we do that fraction there. So I get 1,05 to 2 decimal places times 10 to exponent 15. And then, of course, this is heads because it's frequency. So, always know the SI units. So, that was three marks. Of course, I think this formula is good. Substitution and the answer. Pretty easy to figure out what's going on there. 9, 1, 3. Calculate the maximum kinetic energy. Maximum kinetic energy. Of course, what is the story here? It says photons with energy 8,8. .8. Right times 10 to the minus 19 joules are incident on a zinc surface. Now we want to know the kinetic energy of the ejected electrons, okay? All right, so let's see. We know here that, well, the energy of all of these ejected electrons is essentially the sum of the work function plus the EK max. All right. So be very comfortable using this formula. And then now they told us that the energy, okay, let's just first isolate what we want. It tells us now that our EK max is going to be basically the energy of the photons minus the work function of the metal, right? And then they told us that this was 8,8 .8 times 10 to the minus 19. Then this is going to subtract. What was the work function? They told us is 6,90 times 10 to the minus 19. If you consider this part as x, you know that this is essentially 8,8 .8 .8 minus 6,9, okay? 8,8 8 minus 
and then this is essentially 1 comma 9 0 because remember they said to two decimal places times 10 to the minus 19 joules of course easy question again that one substitution the answer you get your three marks and then you disappear into the thin air <laughs> All right, all right, all right, all right. So let's do 9.2. You're feeling tired. Had a long night. Okay. It says now green is the most common color observed in the Aurora Borealis. Don't even know what that is. Northern lights, I don't know also what that is, but doesn't matter. The wavelength of the green light is, so we know the wavelength, that is lambda, is 5,57, sorry, 557,7 nanometers. Now what you need to know, nano means to the minus 9, okay? So basically this is 557,7 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. I think the only trick is there is that conversion you need to know what that is when they say picometers you need to know when they say you know heptometers or whatever you just need to know those little subscripts or is it latin prefaces yeah those are prefaces know what they imply in terms of your scientific notation or at least those digits uh, that's just another take-home message that please make sure you revise those picos, heptos, nanos, micro, you know, and all those things. Yeah, you need to know. You need to know. Or else you will feel like you are burning. Yo, I'm not too well though. I'm having a lot of cramps. Okay, it says now, calculate the energy emitted for this green emission line. Hmm, 4 marks, okay. We can deal with this, but we know that, well, energy equals Planck's constant multiplied by frequency. But here they gave us what? The wavelength, okay. But now, what is the relationship of wavelength and frequency? We know that the speed of light is defined by the frequency multiplied by the wavelength so we can actually use this uh, this is going to be this one instead of this we make the frequency the subject of the formula it becomes actually the speed of light over the wavelength okay that's what we do so easy easy stuff there so what do we do now we know that Planck's constant is 6,6 6 times 10 to the minus 34 if you have forgotten it check it in your information sheet then what is the speed of light is 3,0 times 10 to the 8 okay meters per second of course and then this one is going to be this 557,7 times 10 to the minus 9 because they said nano or nano nanometers okay so that is what we have so we simply just do this nice and easy Ah, so this is going to be 6,6 6 to the minus 34 into 3 to the 8 divide by 557,7 7 to the nine, minus 9. Okay, great stuff. So what I get here is 3,55, okay? To two decimal places of course remember that is the dictation from the general instructions times 10 to the minus 19 but now that is energy so this is joules okay so i hope that's easy to follow and it's essentially how you get your four marks i think that and then knowing that nanometers is to the minus nine is quite important and then of course here the other mark is for the general uh, substitution and then the answer so walk away with the four marks there no problem hey 
I feel like I'm taking forever and this thing is short here when when's on now it says uh, scientists are able to identify the green emission line as originating in the atomic oxygen in the atmosphere okay they're identifying that this green is from the oxygen hmm. now the question says how can scientists use the energy of emission line to uniquely identify an element okay of course we know that if we have a nucleus of an element and then let's just imagine this is our oxygen then you will have electrons I don't know I'm just going to go general about it <coughs> so this is Paul is is it off bow I don't remember those guys man whether it's Polly no but Polly's principle is all about spins of there's electrons so they must have opposite spins so that they don't repel anyway I don't know if this is uh, Polly's diagram or off power's diagram <laughs> hey guys learn science man learn science so that you know what this is okay oh, 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 oh. you need to know these things because if you don't your science is going to be painful let me just check what that is because I need you guys to know it let me see if my resource is next to me will assist me in giving you what you need you guys because you need to know this you need to know this otherwise what is the point uh, there's no point if you don't know this then you may as well kill yourselves <laughs> hey, yeah, 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 yeah. hey do you see any, do you see now? Mm, 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 mm. Ewen. <laughs> yo, 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 wait. Hey, I can't find this thing now. I cannot find it, huh? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's actually the guy, I think it's a, it's a Swedish scientist, it's Neil Bohr, it's Neil Bohr, Neil Bohr model okay of an atom okay not a problem let's just imagine that so we know that when these electrons I mean the nucleus has compact neutrons and protons so they don't really move for these to actually move you have to break this atom and we know that in radioactivity when this decays then these start moving and then we talk of alpha particles which essentially is what we use for x-rays and other things so electrons they are mostly the ones that technically move so when they bounce from one energy level to the other and then of course usually an emission spectrum is when an, an, an electron in a higher orbital sort of moves to a lower energy that means this was in an excited state if we imagine and then it's going back to ground state and then it will emit some sort of spectra okay so what happens is we know now for a fact that this emission spectrum is achieved when electrons sort of like um, they give off energy all right when they changing from one orbital to the one below usually it's all about the transitions of energy between the orbitals but we know that these orbitals are unique for each element and that would mean if you then compare the emission spectrum and the energy transitions that you are observing then you compare those to what is known for these atoms or for these elements then you can es essentially identify a pattern that is similar or that is exactly like the one you will be observing 
So this is how you would answer that question that says how can scientists use energy of the emission line to uniquely identify an element. All we know is that energy emission, let's just say emission energy is due to transitions of energy ish energy by electrons uh, moving between orbitals right and we know that these orbitals are essentially unique for each atom or element okay and therefore by using comparisons of known uh, atomic energy transitions to one in question it can be easy to identify a common pattern. Let's just say that. Hey, now since it's long as means as me as pale and general president, wait. Hey, he speaks a lot of English. That guy, but he doesn't mean anything. In fact, you just listen and you feel like he's just not saying anything. Anyway, I'm not against the man personally, but. His choice of words really show me that he has no idea of what he usually talks about. And that's why it never happens. Anyway, so the emissions energy, what? Emission energy or spectrum. Let's just say emission spectrum, not energy. Of course, it's due to transition of energy by electrons moving between orbitals, right? And these orbitals being unique for each atom. Therefore, using comparisons of known atomic energy transitions uh, to the one in question that means what you are observing right now it can be easy to identify a common pattern and therefore the atom that is most likely involved in that emission spectrum so this is how you can get your two marks I, I feel like this should be about four marks or so because there's a lot you need to say here before you can jump to that conclusion and in essence you get your 14 marks and that's the end of the 200 marks of this paper one i hope you guys have enjoyed the ride and besides just enjoying the ride you've been able to learn something which i believe will have made a difference in your strength and your comfort now handling physical science questions you know because your trial is going to be coming up soon so you may as well learn as much as you can and I hope and believe I've been of help to those who are lucky to find these videos and of course thank you very much for your watching these videos and sharing where you can and of course for your subscriptions as well because it really motivates me to really continue to do more and on top of that the more that I do as you continue to like it and to join in it becomes more available for others as well so yeah let's keep our steam train moving so we are done with paper one so we're going to try and do paper two i'll try to be a little bit faster with that paper so that we don't take too long to do it so we'll just do it over the course of this coming week and maybe this weekend as well because i also want us to touch some work on mathematics yeah and then we can see if we're feeling already then we can just take uh, our dbe past exam question papers for your trials maybe just one for each subject and paper of course and then i feel after that you guys can have all the time then to study on your own and try to consolidate because what is important is that you guys do this yourselves and I can tell you it's easy to follow what I'm doing here but when you have to do it yourself it's going to be a lot harder <laughs> I, believe me 
it's going to be a lot harder because then your thinking is going to be in practice and that is usually the most challenging part but as you keep doing it you will get comfortable because now you have a cushion of knowing where to go when you get stuck isn't it there's plenty of good teachers on youtube guys so don't only limit yourselves to this channel trust me there's a whole lot of the best there and they are essentially teachers most of them and therefore they are even aware of what your curriculum is all about so they would be the best ones as you know reference points but here it's all action okay so we're just going to be applying what you should be knowing more than me teaching you what you should know okay all right guys thank you and let's see you in the next video bye bye